Recording in progress. So no screens this morning. If there's a Bible handy and you like to read along, Psalm 90. And the Pew Bibles... <clears throat> Revised Standard Version, not sure what the Pew Bibles here offer. Revised Standard Version. This will be from the new Revised Standard Version, obviously much better. Because <laughs> it's new. You might notice a few discrepancies or differences in the text, but that's okay. You can kind of notice and say, huh, they, <clears throat> they must have updated this for a good reason. I wonder what it is. So let's, let's read together. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Our opening hymn, by the way, thank you, was based on this text. You did not know that? <laughs> oh, the ways of the Spirit. You turn us back to dust and say, turn back you mortals, for a thousand years in your sight, are like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. You sweep them away, they are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, in the evening it fades and withers. For we are consumed by your anger, by your wrath we are overwhelmed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your countenance. For all our days pass away under your wrath. Our years come to an end like a sigh. The days of our life are 70 years or perhaps 80, if we are strong. Even then, their span is only toil and trouble they are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger? Your wrath is as great as the fear that is due to you. So teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. Turn, O Lord, how long? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days of you as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for us the work of our hands. Oh, prosper the work of our hands. In the reading of the text, may the word of God find its way into our hearts and our souls. Amen. One wonders, <clears throat> with all the Hebrew scriptures, the law, the prophets, the wisdom literature, and the Psalms, one wonders how Jesus found himself in these writings we call the Hebrew text or the Old Testament 
One wonders how Jesus found his footing in these materials. One wonders how Jesus found his spiritual footing, his theological footing, his psychological and emotional footing. Jesus quotes the Hebrew texts now and again in his ministry, as we read in the Gospels. In his conversations with scholars of the day, he works with these texts, these Hebrew texts. Surely he had heard these scriptures growing up again and again in the synagogue. And as a young man, maybe he had access to scrolls or to rabbis. And surely these scriptures significantly take, shaped his sense of God. And they most certainly would have tuned the ear of his heart to the call of God upon his life. Jesus read this psalm. It's beyond wonderful to me. It's beyond amazing to me that this psalm before us today was read by Jesus, known by Jesus, loved by Jesus, that it had an impact on Jesus. This psalm we can hold in our hands. Jesus held in his hands. So let's take a closer look here. What might Jesus have seen in this text? How might this text have affected him? Based upon the Jesus we've come to know. So when you look at the arc of Jesus' life, when you look at what he did with his life and what he did with his death, you get the sense that those opening lines of Psalm 90 had thoroughly penetrated his thinking and his heart from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. A renowned Hebrew scholar, Robert Alter, takes that opening line in that opening stanza, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The Hebrew scholar, Robert Alter, renders it this way, from forever to forever, you are God. Lovely. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God's not going anywhere. God says to Moses, who, by the way, is listed as the author of this psalm. God says to Moses, I am, remember at the burning bush? To talk about God as everlasting to everlasting suggests not only that God says, I am, as God said to Moses, but that God also says, I was, I have been, I will be God. God's not going anywhere. Nations, empires, kingdoms, 
all of these transient. God's not going anywhere. So why not put all your chips on God? It's an interesting way to consider Jesus' understanding of his life, isn't it? Give it away for the one real thing, the everlasting thing, the forever thing, the only real thing there has ever been and ever will be, God. Jesus is all in. What, what bet could be safer? I think Jesus saw it that way. From our perspective then, we read the Gospels, and the word safe is not how we would describe Jesus' approach to life. It doesn't take very long in his public ministry for certain people or groups to react to him with physical force or to begin to plot his demise. Jesus is not deterred. His life is with God in God, for God, from God, going to God, the everlasting one. He belongs to God from everlasting to everlasting. He feels utterly safe, deeply serene. You get a sense of this. In Jesus, deeply joyful. He belongs to God, and it's catching. The people around him sense. They glimpse they belong to God, too. Jesus wants us to feel as safe in the world, as safe in God, as safe with God as he does. So the rest of the psalm now is a meditation on God's eternalness as over against human temporalness, temporariness. God is everlasting. You and I are like grass in our mortality, spring up wither. Our days are numbered, says the psalmist, but to God a thousand years are as a moment. In the light of God we recognize our hidden faults. In the countenance of God we recognize our hidden faults. Not pleasant, but necessary. For here we find humility and wisdom as we recognize our hidden faults. And we come to a recognition that this everlasting to everlasting God is all about bringing us into ever deepening communion with God's self. There's a lot of wisdom here in this, these stanzas of the psalm. A lot of wisdom here for Jesus to have savored in his heart. In fact, the scholars who comment on this psalm note that it resonates with Hebrew wisdom literature like the book of Job, the book of Ecclesiastes. 
through the vagaries of our mortal existence, through the vagaries of our mortal experience, if we wait upon God, through the trials, through the tribulations, if we continue to trust God, even when we have lost sight of God, the favor of the Lord our God, now we're getting to the end of the psalm, the favor of the Lord our God comes upon us. That Hebrew scholar Robert Alter translates favor as sweetness. The sweetness of the Lord our God comes upon us. God has not gone away. God never goes away through the dark moments of our fleeting lives. God, in fact, has moved closer to us and to discover this is a grace and a wonder and a gift and a miracle. It feels like favor as the psalmist talks about it. It feels like sweetness. Here at the end of the psalm. And then we pray these final lines. Prosper the work of our hands. The scholar Alter once again translate the, translates the phrase this way. Instead of prosper the work of our hands, He puts it this way, the work of our hands firmly found for us. May the work of our hands be firmly found. Hmm. Prosper the work of our hands. May the work of our hands be firmly found. That's a pretty confident prayer. This is the prayer of a person who has come to trust, as Jesus surely must have. A person who has come to trust that a life lived in God and with God and from God, the everlasting, is a life that bears everlasting fruit. Remember Jesus in the upper room says to his disciples, you did not choose me, I chose you to go and bear fruit, fruit that lasts, right? Prosper the work of our hands, we pray. May the work of our hands be firmly found. According to Robert Alter, in his translation of the text, he has a footnote. It goes like this. The psalmist is expressing a confidence that our everlasting to everlasting God can give solid substantiality, scholar language, right? But you get the meaning here. The psalmist is expressing a confidence that our everlasting to everlasting God can give solid substantiality to our fleeting human experience. What a liberating wisdom. Can you imagine Jesus catching a, a shaft of light, of wisdom's light, coming out of this psalm? And recognizing that to know that everything he does in God, 
with God, for God, from God, everything he does would last, would be from everlasting to everlasting. And can we see that same, same shaft of light beaming out of this text to us? Helping us to see that everything we do in God, with God, for God, from God, has solid substantiality. That our lives are not a mere whisper, here today, gone tomorrow. But as we bet everything, on the God who is from everlasting to everlasting. Something everlasting is there in the lives that we live out with this God. I think from the core of his being, Jesus had come to know this. May it be for us Two, let's say, as we conclude the prayer together, repeat this line after me. I'm going to divide it up for us. First, the whole line. May the work of our hands be firmly found. May the work of our hands May the work of our hands, may the work of our hands, amen.